We are sometimes told that we must believe those who say they've been raped. From the point of view of persons adjudicating such claims, the issue is often presented as if there were only two options. Either those who make such claims must be believed, unless and until there is good reason to doubt their claims, or they should be doubted, unless and until there is good reason to believe their claims. But these aren't the only options. There is a third possibility, which is a suspension of judgment. That is, that the claim should neither be believed nor doubted, but rather taken seriously and investigated. Now, some people argue that it is better for some liars and fantasists to get away with their lies and their fantasies, and that those with genuine claims should be discouraged from coming forward with those complaints. But this is to ignore the devastating effects of false accusations on those who are falsely accused. Rarely, if ever, is the same publicity given to the rebuttal of false claims as it is to their initial assertion. And even if that happens, the stain on the character of those who've been falsely accused is never completely washed away. There is, in fact, strong pressure to shift the onus of proof onto the accused in rape and sexual assault cases, which would require those accused to prove that they are innocent rather than requiring the prosecution to prove them guilty. Edward Greer quotes Linda Brookover Burke, the author of a definitive 1989 study defining rape, as claiming that the ultimate objective of rape reform is to shift the burden of proof from the victim to the offender. And this brings us to the notion of due process, which seems to be a very dry and technical and, and rather boring concept. Who could possibly get excited about it? Well, I could for one. Now, what are the elements of due process? There, there are quite a few elements, but here I'm only going to concentrate on one. In criminal cases, the first and by far the most important element of due process, described as the golden thread running through the web of English criminal law, is the presumption of innocence of the defendant. It's not that the defendant is innocent until proved guilty, he's simply presumed to be innocent. This is merely a presumption, of course, and it is one that can be overturned by evidence and testimony. It is the prosecution's task to do the overturning. It is not the defense's task to establish the defendant's innocence. A habit has developed of referring to those who report rape as victims as if the genuineness of their claims was already established. This practice slyly undermines investigative and judicial impartiality. In 2017, the UK's Justice Secretary, Liz Truss, announced new measures to spare alleged rape victims from having to face live cross-examination in court. If these measures were to be implemented, victims would be able to give their evidence in pre-recorded videos that the jury would see after the trial began. Ms. Truss said, quote, the changes to rape trials would prevent victims facing the trauma of confronting their attackers without reducing the right to a fair trial, end of quote. At the risk of repeating myself, let me just say that a moment's reflection will show the glaring problem with this ostensibly compassionate move. In using the term victim and thus assuming that there is in fact a victim. The procedure prejudges the outcome of the trial. During the course of the trial, all that we have, legally speaking, of course, is an alleged attacker and an alleged victim. Until the jury brings in the guilty verdict, we don't know legally whether we have a victim or not, so that the measures proposed by mistrust, though no doubt well-intentioned, are prejudicial to the trial process. The proposed measures then involve a none too subtle overturning of the presumption of innocence. Moreover, since most of the alleged attackers are men, the move is, even if only inadvertently, sexist. It is perhaps not too much to see the truss move as an example of legal misandry. There may be a victim, there may not. A woman may tell the truth, a woman may tell what she believes to be the truth, but which isn't the truth, or a woman may lie. A man accused of rape may tell the truth when he denies the charge of rape, or he may lie, but in the UK he will not have the benefit of anonymity that the alleged victim has. If complainants are allowed to give their evidence via video, 
This already indicates that the justice system regards their evidence as more worthy of protection than that of the defendant. If the cross-examination is also allowed to be pre-recorded, that exacerbates an already very dangerous prejudicial tendency. The chairman of the Criminal Bar Association, Angela Rafferty QC, made the eminently sensible and one would have thought obvious remark that it is not the job of the police or the CPS to judge the truthfulness or otherwise of any allegation made. Dominic Grieve, the former UK Attorney General, said that he found the use of the term victim for a person making a complaint unfortunate because it creates a distortion in the process as police carry out an investigation. The police must stop referring to complainants as victims. They must be welcoming to complainants and take them seriously, but must always keep an open mind about complaints, he said. Alison Levitt, the former principal legal advisor to the UK's Director of Public Prosecution, said that the police, quote, must approach these cases with an open mind. It is their duty to investigate whether or not it leads towards the suspect or indeed away from the suspect. This, one would think, is a statement straight out of the big book of the bleeding, blatantly obvious, but in our new supposedly victim-centric normative environment, apparently not. The presumption of innocence is attacked not only by the state and its agencies when they play the victim card, but also by moral panics such as Me Too and other online campaigns. In the Me Too world, due process takes a battering. Accusation equals conviction. End of story. No defense will be accepted. There's no need for trials, no need for evidence. All we need is an accusation. Vox populi, vox diaboli. The people have spoken. Now let the lynching commence. The casual dismissal of the presumption of innocence is particularly grating in accusations of rape or sexual abuse, where there are very often no witnesses to the alleged crime apart from the complainant and the accused, and where, more often than not, there is a complex and messy relation between the two parties. Because of a deplorable history of past failures to take rape and sexual abuse claims seriously, there is a tendency to give the benefit of the doubt to the accusers rather than to those accused. Carolyn Hoyle writes, quote, even in cases where the evidence only consists of testimony from the alleged victim and is strongly rebutted by the alleged perpetrator, the moral imperative not to, quote, let down another victim, unquote, or to leave a possible sex offender free to cause further harm may be compelling. While this must logically reduce the chances of guilty persons avoiding prosecution, in other words, false negatives, it also risks increasing the likelihood of innocent people being presumed or found guilty, false positives, end of quote. I believe her was the mantra of choice during the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court confirmation hearings. It seemed that if one wasn't prepared to believe Christine Margaret Blasey Ford, one had to disbelieve her. It didn't seem to occur to many people to suspend judgment until the evidence was heard in full. Bill Burr, the TV stand-up comic, says in one of his routines, Believe women? What? All of them? I'll give you 87%, but that last 13% that keys your car, lights your stuff on fire and puts a family pet in a pot of stew? Yeah, due process. Somebody says something happened and somebody else says it happened this way. Now it's frontier justice. And then he paused. Did you see just how nervous everybody got in here just because I suggested there should be due process? In the Kavanaugh hearings, we witnessed amazing scenes of people, mainly women, running around after senators, buttonholing them in lifts and along corridors. Now, where else have we heard of women running around in feral packs, tearing men to non-metaphorical pieces? Let's see. Hmm. Ah, yes, the Maynards. The Maynards, their name means the raving ones, were the female followers of Dionysus. If you think the Maynards are to be found only in classical times, think again. We have all seen the footage of the Beatles being pursued by hordes of young women and screamed that so loudly at concerts that their music was inaudible. George Harrison lamented, the more fame we got, the more girls came to see us, everybody making a noise so that nobody could hear us. But Beatlemania is not an isolated instance of this phenomenon. The same screaming and fainting happened to Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Elvis, Tom Jones, and many others. Even in the 19th century, 
pianist Franz Liszt inspire the same kind of maniacal attention from women. This form of behavior seems to be a purely female phenomenon with no male equivalent. The Spice Girls and the Sugar Babes were not screamed at by hordes of pubescent young males. During the Maynard mania of the Kavanaugh hearings, Senator Maisie Hirono said, quote, I just want to say to the men in this country, just shut up and step up. Do the right thing for a change. Not only do women like Dr. Ford, who bravely come forward, need to be heard, but they need to be believed. Can you imagine any male senator or any man in public office saying, I just want to say to the women in this country, just shut up and step up. Do the right thing for a change. An interviewer on TV asked the senator, quote, doesn't Kavanaugh have the same presumption of innocence as anyone in America? Senator Hirona responded, I put his denial in the context of everything that I know about how he approaches his cases, unquote. You'll notice, it's hard not to notice, that Hirono doesn't answer the question that she is asked. Just how difficult was it to say, yes, he is entitled to the presumption of innocence in response to that question. Instead, she made the point that her disbelief in his protestations of innocence were linked to her disagreement with his judicial rulings. This elliptical non-answer was made even more clearly in her approach on CNN when she said, quote, he's very outcome driven. He has an ideological agenda. And I can sit here and talk to you about some of the cases that exemplify his, in my view, inability to be fair, unquote. It appears that her owner thought that Kavanaugh's judicial decisions with which she disagrees somehow undermined his credibility, totally. Another questioner on TV asked her, can you clarify what you meant? Do you believe Judge Kavanaugh does deserve the presumption of innocence or not? Once again, the senator conspicuously refused to say, yes, he deserves to enjoy the presumption of innocence as does everyone else. Instead, she replied, we're not in a law court. We're actually in a court of credibility at this point. And without having the FBI report or some semblance of trying to get corroboration, we are left with the credibility of the two witnesses." End of quote. Well, I don't know what the court of credibility is, but I'd hate to be dragged before one, especially if Senator Hirono were sitting on its bench. In 2018, Professional rugby players, Patty Jackson and Stuart Olding, were tried for rape and eventually acquitted. In the same trial, two other men, Blaine McElroy and Rory Harrison, were acquitted on related charges. Following their acquittal, Jackson and Olding were fired by their employer. The jury settled the legal formality of their guilt, wrote Sarah Dighton, but as with myriad other men, the case to answer doesn't end with an acquittal. Well, that's what she wrote. What case is there to answer that hasn't been answered? Is there another law beyond the law? From the accounts of the trial reported in the media, it's unlikely that there will be many people who will be impressed with the moral probity of the defendants, or even if it comes to that, with the moral probity of the complainant. But that's an entirely different matter from assessing the defendant's responsibility for criminal actions. If we all have a criminal case to answer because of our supposedly <laughs> moral defects, then the criminal courts are going to be even busier than they already are. In the aftermath of the extensively reported trial of the Belfast Four, the Irish Independent reported that thousands of people had attended rallies nationwide expressing solidarity with the woman at the center of the Belfast rape trial. Now let it be clearly understood that they were expressing solidarity with the woman that the jury determined had not been raped. The events were advertised using the hashtag I believe her, something the jury who had heard all the evidence had conspicuously failed to do. But of course, our ralliers had the advantage over the jury of not having had their minds contaminated by evidence and witnessing the examinations and cross-examinations at the trial. The ralliers, on the other hand, believed her, presumably because women are never confused, never ambivalent, never vindictive, and they never ever exaggerate, misrepresent, or lie. One rallier said, it's time change is made, although it's not entirely clear what kinds of change she had in mind. That's if she had anything in mind at all, unless it was the advantage attached to going straight to conviction upon accusation and dispensing with the expensive triviality of a trial. 
some of the ralliers were of the opinion that we should now concern ourselves with how people who make claims of rape and sexual assault are treated. Well, indeed, in fact, I agree. Uh, I am inclined to say that at the moment they are treated with excessive gullibility, with lots of loud encouragement from the misandrous authorities, with public outbursts of sympathy from the media and the useful idiots of rent rally and with no serious consequences to anyone except to the reputations and finances of the defendants if the charges are unsustained. The ralliers appear to be incensed that the now 21-year-old complainant at the center of the Belfast case spent eight days on the stand. Well, yes, what did they expect? She was the principal witness for the prosecution. Without her evidence, there would have been no case to answer. What do they suggest the defense should do? Is it their suggestion that she shouldn't give evidence, shouldn't have that evidence cross-examined, and that her deposition simply be taken as gospel and the accused convicted forthwith? Well, of course, that's a silly question. Of course, that's their contention. Steve Moxton might have been writing of the Belfast Four when he wrote, quote, the vitriol expressed for the men accused, whether subsequently found guilty or innocent, is on a par with that reserved for murderers and sometimes worse. One newspaper reported that, quote, after the verdict, collective anger was unleashed across the internet and across the island with demonstrations in the Irish Republic and in Northern Ireland, unquote. Goodness me, not just anger, but collective anger. And according to another rallyer, not just collective anger, but palpable anger. The Twitterati went on the march. The hashtaggers, I believe her, came out in force. Activists, we were told ominously, were lobbying for change to the criminal justice system. Which criminal justice system needed to change and in what way we weren't informed. Quote, our arcane legal system, it seems, is not fit for purpose. It is a system invented by privileged men to further privilege privileged men, lacking compassion and understanding, and it is not victim-centric. Well, why is it not fit for purpose? If it is a system invented by privileged men to further privileged, already privileged men, how is it that anyone ever gets convicted of rape? Why is it that the defendants' names are public property, and even in the event of acquittal, their reputations remain trashed? Why is it that the complainant's name must remain secret? In the particular case in question, how did our not fit for purpose legal system treat our supposedly privileged men, Jackson and Ole? They were publicly accused of rape, had their names and faces constantly in the media, lost their jobs, and incurred enormous legal bills to defend themselves on charges of which they were eventually acquitted. What man would want to be privileged in this way? Now let me turn to the issue of false allegations. I have time to mention only a few examples. I discuss many more in my book. Liam Allen, a student, was charged with 12 counts of rape and sexual assault. In 2017, his trial was discontinued when it turned out that the investigating officer had failed to reveal evidence from the complainant's phone that effectively undermined the case for the prosecution. It seems that the officer felt that the texts were, as he put it, too personal. What was in those texts? Well, nothing much, except that the complainant had requested casual sex from Allen and had fantasized about rough sex with him. Allen spent two years on bail before the trial was discontinued. During this time, the police had in their possession the evidence that eventually exonerated him. Was this just a matter of normal incompetence or an oversight resulting from a too heavy caseload? Well, not quite. Some issues of principle are involved here, in particular, a culture of believe the victim. Judge Peter Gower said that Mr. Allen would not have been charged if these messages had been seen. The complainant is to be investigated for attempting to pervert the course of justice. She told police that she hated sex, but she wrote hundreds of text messages to friends discussing in detail her enjoyment of sex and saying she was devastated when Mr. Allen said that they could not meet again. The Crown Prosecution Service and the police are reviewing why 40,000 text and WhatsApp messages weren't handed over until after Mr. Allen's trial had begun. Edited excerpts from these messages were produced in court. And one of the crucial text messages from the alleged victim that wasn't disclosed to the defense stated, it was not against my will. 
Retired police chief David Bryant had his conviction for rape overturned in the Court of Appeal. He had been in jail for three years. In 2012, his accuser, Denny Day, claimed that Mr. Bryant had raped him some 35 years earlier. Before reporting this alleged rape to the police, Mr. Day sent Mr. Bryant a letter in which he threatened to make him pay one way or the other and further threatened that unless Mr. Bryant got in touch with him, he would go to the newspapers and to the police. Rather than follow up a possible case of attempted blackmail against Mr. Day, the police pursued Mr. Bryant, who was convicted in 2013, on the basis of Mr. Day's testimony alone, receiving a sentence of eight and a half years. In the High Court judgment, Master Gary Thorne had said that Mr. Day's letter to Mr. Bryant, quote, would not strike any reasonable person as anything other than a blackmail note. It is clearly threatening. The invitation to make contact seems well away from a need to discuss and elicit an apology, but instead seeks either a financial payment or retribution through the threat of police involvement and publicity. End of quote. Mr. Thornet also held that Mr. Day had deliberately used the police and Crown Prosecution Service to wage a campaign of self-aggrandizement. Mr. Bryant was eventually freed in 2016 when the Court of Appeal quashed his conviction after it emerged that Mr. Day had sought medical help for being a serial liar. One of his more piquant lies was that he was a champion boxer who would have fought at the Los Angeles Olympics if he hadn't been so traumatized by the rape. Mr. Bryant's lawyer pointed out that Bryant was lucky in that Day's lies were in the end easily exposed. He said, quote, if he, that is Day, had been a really good psychopath, Day would still be in prison. How many Daves are there wrongly locked up? I'm guessing it is in the hundreds. That's the scandal, and it's only getting worse. End of quote. Two significant factors in this appalling case are worthy of note. First, the alleged rape took place 35 years before it was reported. And second, Mr. Bryant was convicted on the basis of Mr. Day's testimony alone. The temporal distance of the alleged rape from its report is a feature of what are known as cases of historic sex abuse. And given the issues of memory already discussed, this makes such claims extremely problematic. The conviction of one person on the sole testimony of another is independently of issues of temporal distance, also problematic. Lewis Richardson, a former student at the University of Durham, went through 15 months of forensic anguish before he was cleared in 2016 of all charges of rape and sexual assault. His accuser continued to send him suggestive messages long after the alleged rape had occurred. This did not, it seems, raise any issues with the police or the CPS. Will Richardson ever be able to erase the stigma resulting from the 15 month long investigation? Probably not. This can have practical as well as psychological consequences. Angela Epstein wrote, quote, imagine future employers Googling names of prospective candidates to assess suitability. Sure, the newspaper cuttings record Richardson's innocence, but when you've got a waiting room full of hungry and equally capable students desperate for work, why take a punt on this one? The disparity between what happens to the acquitted accused and the anonymous alleged victim is striking. What are the costs of the woman who makes a false accusation? One that can be determined, not just to be a matter of disputed interpretation, but one that is outright false and known to be so by the complainant. Well, very little as it turns out. What are the costs of those accused by false accusations? Quite a lot in some cases. Jay Cheshire, who was falsely accused of rape, was discovered hanged in the park. He was 17 years old. The alleged victim withdrew the allegation two weeks before his death, but Cheshire was, as his mother recounts, distraught as a result of the charges made against him. Angela Epstein writes, quote, when rape accusations prove false and the defendant is acquitted, the cloak of anonymity should immediately be rescinded. The law fails to take into account what happens when a boozy young woman, remorseful at playing away from a jealous boyfriend, salves her conscience by going after the innocent young man with whom she had consensual sex nor does it address the manifest injustice to men in the approximately 40% of rape cases where they are acquitted. The Crown Prosecution Service has admitted that there are systematic disclosure issues in criminal cases, revealing that some 900 criminal cases were dropped in 2017 for that very reason. Some commentators have speculated that the disclosure problems were the result of under-resourcing. 
a report on the CPS Rape and Serious Sexual Offences Units published in 2016 by Her Majesty's Crown Prosecution Service Inspectorate warned of what it called a vicious circle in which police sometimes handed incomplete case files to CPS lawyers who then, instead of demanding more evidence, chose to charge suspects because they were under pressure to do so. The report noted, quote, that there is considerable pressure on the CPS to improve on success rates and to prosecute more cases, which may lead to some cases being pursued, even though there is little chance of obtaining a conviction after a trial. The principal problem is simply the failure of the police and CPS to disclose pertinent evidence. In the words of one critic, the wrongly accused wait until the day of trial or perhaps for eternity for the state to disclose material that fatally undermines the prosecution case. Of course, there are those who will make light of the significance of the collapsed rape trials. One such person is Charlotte Proudman, who describes the problems around the lack of disclosure in the trials I've just discussed as a kind of media frenzy. While conceding the potential of such trials have to cause injustice for defendants and complainants alike, she poo-poos what she regards as the disproportionate focus on failed rape prosecutions to the exclusion of collapsed trials for other crimes. She then goes on to claim that, quote, the microscopic reporting of collapsed rape trials is part of a broader backlash against the Harvey Weinstein allegations and the Me Too movement, which, she says, quote, exposed endemic sexual harassment and even rape, end of quote. She wants more to be done to encourage women to report cases of rape, but states, without giving any reason, that this doesn't actually entail granting defendants anonymity. But why not? She appears to have absolutely no idea of the opprobrium in which rape is held in society, and rightly so. So much so that to be accused of rape, even if subsequently cleared, leaves an indelible stain on a man's reputation. As we saw in the Allen case, the judge said, Mr. Allen leaves the courtroom an innocent man without a strain on his character, but that, while legally so, is manifestly not so in terms of the public's perception. Ms. Proudman believes that the reporting on the Allen case and other similar cases sends a message to women that their allegations of rape might not be believed if they claim that the sexual encounter was consensual and later report rape, or that it might not be believed if they ever discussed rape fantasies and later report rape. Really? How shocking. When one considers that the principle, often the only evidence in rape trials, is the testimony of the complainant, her credibility is paramount, so that conceding consensuality and then subsequently changing her story might affect how her evidence is received by a jury, likewise with reports of her fantasies. Are false accusations of rape really all that significant? Isn't the apprehension and conviction of rapists what really matters? And if some men are falsely accused along the way, well, that's unfortunate, but really little more than collateral damage. Well, let's see. In England, James, that's, that's not his real name, was arrested on a charge of rape on the day of his daughter's third birthday. The arrest took place in his home, in front of his new wife, his family, and his friends. His accuser was his ex-wife. Within a week, he was entertaining thoughts of suicide. James's new wife recounts how severely he had deteriorated after the accusation, frequently crying and planning to kill himself. The shame of the accusation, a false accusation, as it turns out, was almost too much to bear. Luckily for him, his name, unlike the name of many men accused of rape, was not published. Still, it was eight months before the charges were dropped and he was free to pick up the shattered pieces of his life. Feminists will sometimes argue that there is no reason for a woman to make an accusation of rape unless it really happened, especially since, according to them, the process of investigation and prosecution is so traumatic as to amount to a second rape. Karen Smith, the executive director of the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, for example, said, quote, nobody would report sexual assault needlessly because it is a grueling process to go through, end of quote. But they would, Miss Smith, and they do, because there are reasons. Rejection after a single incident sexual encounter, shame and self-loathing after regretted sex, the use of the rape accusation as a way of displacing responsibility when the sexual encounter becomes known to others, such as parents or boyfriends, spite, mental derangement, 
And as I've already mentioned, Angela Epstein noting, a boozy young woman remorseful at playing away from a jealous boyfriend solves her conscience by going after the innocent young man with whom she had consensual sex. There's much evidence of sympathy and compassion for those who complain of rape and sexual assault. But where is the compassion for those who suffer as a result of false accusations? A common cry of caution when it comes to dealing with false allegations is that we don't want to make too much of them in case it discourages genuine victims from coming forward. The idea is that a failure to convict might open the complainant to perjury charges or wasting police time. But this doesn't necessarily follow. There's an important difference between lying, which is deliberately claiming that something is true, which you know to be false, and telling a factual untruth, which can be a matter of your saying what you believe to be true, but which is not in fact true, or which others do not believe. False allegations can be either lying or just factual untruth. That's for juries to decide. In many cases where no conviction ensues, I suspect it's because the jury, given the presumption of innocence, didn't believe that the complainant was telling the truth or the whole truth or nothing but the truth. It doesn't follow from this that they believed that she was lying. The jury is quite capable of coming to the conclusion that a complainant believes the version of the story that she is telling but that the story is not in fact true or not true in relevant respects. Some accusations of rape are in fact malicious and without any foundation, made by women who for one reason or another are seemingly quite happy to see innocent men pilloried and sent to jail. It says something about the times in which we live, that we are more disposed to believe that a significant number of men are disposed to rape women than that it is conceivable that a significant number of women are willing to lie about being raped. Other accusations lie in a gray area between truth and falsity. It may be true that rape trials in such cases are traumatic for women who are genuinely convinced, however groundlessly, that they've been the victims of rape, but they are nowhere near as traumatic as they are for the men who are falsely accused. If convicted, they face a lengthy jail term and the effect of ruination of their lives. But even if acquitted, they are exposed, in the UK at least, to publicity and sometimes to informal sanctions. To repeat, there's a difference between lying on the one hand and on the other, making a statement that is judged not to be true. Where it is clear that the alleged victim was lying, then she should be prosecuted. Those who seem to think that women never lie about being sexually assaulted or raped should acquaint themselves with the truly extraordinary case of Claire Morgan. In 2017, Ms. Morgan claimed that a taxi driver had sexually assaulted her. She told a detailed story about the assault. The driver spent three hours in police custody and faced the prospect of sexual assault charges. In addition, he was forced to surrender his taxi permit during the six-week investigation, thereby being unable to work. The police spent 60 hours checking out Morgan's story. In the end, the diligence of the investigators, together with CCTV, revealed inconsistencies in Morgan's account, spared him prosecution. So far, a depressingly familiar tale, but now comes the twist. Morgan had also set up a Facebook profile under an assumed name, Sarah Jenkins, claiming, as Jenkins, that she had witnessed the attack. She reported bogus details to Crime Stoppers anonymously. Suspicion was aroused when Morgan gave different accounts of the supposed attack to her friends. She received a sentence of two and a half years, perverting the course of justice. In an ironic twist, the newspaper article reporting this bizarre story contained an inset panel advertising phone numbers that victims of sexual assault could call for help and support. Well, what's ironic about that, you might wonder? Well, the story in which it was inset was a story precisely not about sexual assault, but about a spectacularly false allegation of sexual assault. One might have expected the inset to contain phone numbers that those who'd been falsely accused of sexual assault might call for support, but no, not so. If we are to believe all women who make accusations of sexual assault or harassment, what are we to make of the case of five high school girls in Pennsylvania who confessed to targeting a boy with false accusations simply because they didn't like him? The boy was sacked from his job at a swimming pool and underwent multiple court appearances in addition to being detained in a juvenile facility. Girl number one accused the boy of assaulting her in July 2017, but later admitted she'd made up the allegation explaining I just don't like him. The boy was charged with indecent assault and two counts of harassment. He pleaded not guilty, but was put on probation. Later, 
Another accusation of sexual assault was made when a friend of girl number one told the school official that he had sexually assaulted her at her home. These allegations were supported by two other girls. As a result, the boy was charged with indecent assault, criminal trespass and simple assault. A month later, the three girls recanted their allegations and admitted lying about the sexual assault. The boy's parents are now suing the parents of the girls, the school district and the local district attorney. According to them, the girls who made the false accusations have suffered no repercussions. Warren Blackwell spent almost three and a half years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. The whole graphic and detailed story of the sexual assault he was alleged to have perpetrated was a fiction from start to finish. And what is most distressing about this case is that the police suspected as much from the start as they knew that the complainant had not only convictions for offences of dishonesty, but was also a serial complainant. In respect of her early complaints, the police investigation resulted in the judgment that the allegations of assault were untrue and that the supposedly corroborative physical injuries were self-inflicted. None of this information was disclosed to Mr. Blackwell's defense team. To repeat what I wrote earlier, the common cry of caution when it comes to dealing with false allegations is that we don't want to make too much of them lest to discourage genuine victims from coming forward. The idea is that a failure to convict might open the complainant to charges of perjury or wasting police time. But of course, this doesn't necessarily follow. To repeat the point once again, there's a big difference between lying, which is deliberately claiming that something is true, which we know to be false, and telling an untruth, which can be a matter of your saying what you believe to be true, but which is not in fact true, or which others do not believe. False allegations can be either lying or just factually untrue. That's for juries to decide. Some individuals have a tender heart, that is, for those who make false allegations. One of them said, I think we need to keep in mind that people who make false complaints often make them for another reason, such as personal issues, health issues, or even past history of sexual violence. And often when something like this happens, the person can be forgotten in the fury that follows a false allegation. I hope that in this case, the person receives the support they need. End of quote. You know, that's quite a bit of understanding and sympathy for the liar, but not quite so much for the chap who spent 10 months in jail as the result of the lie. And given the reluctance of the criminal law system to prosecute those who make false rape allegations, should those who believe they've been falsely and maliciously accused of that crime try the civil route as a means of redress? Well, take the case of Brian Banks, who was falsely accused of raping a classmate in 2002 when he was just 17 years old. He spent five years in jail and he wasn't exonerated until extraordinarily he managed to record his accuser on tape of lying about the incident. Instead of pleading non guilty when charged, Mr. Banks took a plea bargain because, as he put it himself, I was a big black teenager and no jury would believe anything I said. His accuser, Wanada Gibson, had won a settlement against the Long Beach Unified School District and after Mr. Banks' exoneration, they sued her in return. The courts ordered her to return the money she had been awarded. Now, other men who have been falsely accused have considered the route of civil action, but that's not something that can be routinely advised. As Xavier Donaldson, who is a defense lawyer and a former assistant district attorney in New York said, these suits should be extremely case specific, extremely rare. You cannot win these cases. There is too much backlash. I tell my clients, Innocent before proving guilty is not reality. It's more of a marketing slogan to promote faith in our justice system. Without that premise, the system would fall apart. <laughs>